Good evening. Welcome to the U of A Library and Special Collections. My name is Bob Diaz and I'm an employee of Special Collections and I curated the exhibit out there on civil rights in Arizona. If you haven't had a chance to take a look at it, I invite you to. Thank you. I ran out of time and didn't prepare any written remarks, so this is going to be a little extemporaneous speech, but I think I'm prepared. I've known our guest speakers for many years. I grew up here in Tucson and um, was very fortunate as a youngster in high school to take a Chicano Studies class. And in my Chicano Studies class back in 1975, um, Lupe Castillo was already legendary in our community. That's Lupe over there on the right. And this is Margo Cowan. Margo was also legendary. They were both um, members of the Monzo Area Council, which had an office in Hollywood, Tucson, Arizona, Barrio Hollywood. And uh, we learned about their efforts supporting the immigrant community and fighting for civil rights and social justice. So um, over the last few months, we've had several programs highlighting civil rights in Arizona. Our first program looked at the African American community. Our next program explored the American Indian community and American Indian law cases. And our third program was on the LGBT community in Tucson. So um, tonight's final program will be on the Mexican American community. And I'm really glad you're all here, and it's a real honor uh, to be able to present our speakers. I first want to thank my team leader, India Sparts, Jared, my student assistant, Gina Bauduin, our uh, admin associate extraordinaire, and Laura Bender and the Friends of the University Library for um, helping to sponsor these events. So let me tell you a little bit about Lupe and Margo before I get started. Uh, Lupe Castillo is a native Tucsonan, went to Tucson High School, and um, was an activist from the get-go. She was involved with the Chicano movement and El Coraje newspaper. Some of you may have come to Wednesday's event uh, where Lupe got to speak about El Coraje. And Lupe has also been a longtime professor at Pima Community College um, in the Chicano Studies program there. Margo has been a lawyer for many, many years. Her mother was a journalist and a teacher at Pueblo High School, a very well-known and beloved teacher. And uh, Margo went to Rincon High School. And <laughs> Tucson High School's rival. But Margo's also been a longtime activist, and she's involved as a public defender, um, helping uh, students get through the paperwork um, to get, um, many of these students are called dreamers, dreamer students. So she works with the immigrant community. Both of them have found a group called uh, No More Deaths, and, and they're, they're both very, very well respected, uh, beloved, and um, just incredible uh, members of our community, and we're both, we're all very fortunate to have them, and I'm very fortunate that they agreed to speak. So I'm going to stop now and turn it over to Margo and Lupe. Let's give them a big hand. of the United States and the narrative of the history of the United States, it is a 
that moves from the east to the west, you know, and uh, in its in the very broad terms. And uh, with it comes many narratives that, uh, that we look at. Uh, but for those of us who are centered in this region, indigenous to this region, uh, we do not see ourselves as being in the west or the southwest. We see ourselves as being in the north. Right? So as we sit here, we have to rethink really where we are because that brings us into a different narrative of history, of culture, of time, of storytelling, of mythology as well. Okay? And, and certainly the complex layers that are to be found here in, as a result of that, uh, obviously with uh, the indigenous uh, communities and all the different complexities of layers of people uh, that have come through. We also consider, as we look at uh, the uh, Mexicanos in, in, our, in, in this context, as we look at the Chicano movement, of which I was part of, and is celebrated in uh, the uh, the civil rights in Tucson uh, in the, these 50 years. When uh, we look at that, we have to go beyond just looking at 50 years, but also looking what was possible in the 1960s, the 1950s, 60s, and 70s was possible because of the sacrifices of those who came before us. Right? That there is always uh, other layers that make it possible for us to move in the direction that we were moving in. Um, if we uh, do that, then we have to look, for example, at the Mexican experience. As we think about it today, where uh, Mexicanos, immigrants, have come under enormous assaults uh, in all arenas. It is almost like trying to push us back to what used to be called the Jim Crow uh, laws uh, that are now being co reconfigured in different ways. Um, for example, making it uh, uh, illegal to learn about our one's own history, uh, you know, teaching Chicano studies, uh, or a, a different perspective of history, uh, of re thinking how we look at the past as if there is only one story that is acceptable. So what we have to do then is uh, really to put ourselves in that frame uh, as we look also at the policy of immigration, uh, which Margo will be looking at uh, as we kind of are centering in, in the whole experience of migration and movements uh, that have occurred uh, in this um, region and beyond that. Um, as we're beginning the debates in the United States Congress about, uh, uh, you know, the laws, you know, different reforms, we can go back in time. Uh, we can see that what, it, what is being debated today, uh, and, and we see it in the history. I mean, Benjamin Franklin at one time said, we don't want Germans here because they'll never assimilate, you know, they're militaristic, etc. They refuse to learn English. They are too different from us, right? And we have seen that periodically. Obviously, uh, 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Acts, the Chinese are so other, they cannot ever be part of us, right? Uh, and, and as that was enunciated at a federal level, it is then becomes part of permission for vigilante acts, uh, for hatred, for uh, behavior that it, you know goes to great violence and so forth. Uh, we see this also, and I'm sure this was uh, touched on uh, by other speakers here. Uh, for example, as we look at that march in 1963, Washington, D.C., and what came before that with the destruction 
with the destroying of reconstruction to replace you know the the slave system with a sanitized slave system, which was Jim Crow, right? And to permeate it so that today we still suffer the consequences of that. As we see, uh, for example, if we look at the Mexican experience, that there, the reason we have a border is there was a war between the United States and Mexico. That it wasn't a line that was just simply drawn, but it was a war that established that border. And the consequences from the very beginning of an attempt even by the Mexican government as it existed at that time to ensure that those who remained uh, north of that line were to be treated not as conquered subjects, but first class citizens. And that they would have a right to maintain their lands, and to maintain their language and religion and their cultural existence as such. Right? Uh, that is still with us to this day, but it's still contested ground. It hasn't been settled. The, the legislature in Arizona, the governor of Arizona, is still saying, uh, no, we can't do that. Uh, even as a Constitution of the State of California was being implemented in the 1850s, 1850. Uh, one of the what four rights was to have the laws published in Spanish, uh, to uh, be able to have civil rights as first class citizens as well. So that when we look then and what is being fought today, it has a long history. If, uh, in fact, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the attempts was, well, we should stop this violence that is being visited upon uh, of those Mexicans who are being uh, forced into a second class status, even though the treaty uh, said that they would have first class uh, citizenship. And we were here recently last week with the newspapers. Uh, and there was a very famous newspaper called Clamor Publico, published in uh, Los Angeles by a very, by, by a very young uh, editor uh, in that period of the 1850s, uh, who would register all the lynchings that would occur, all the violent acts, uh, and he would publish sections uh, of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. Uh, to counter uh, that, in fact, uh, there were rights and that people had a right to those rights and that they would fight for these rights and that what people had to do uh, to ensure that against the vigilantism uh, that became part of the, of the uh, you know, the repression, right? So that repressive acts were not carried out only by law, but also by extra legal means. If the laws such as we see today, right, such as the, uh, you know, not allowing the teaching of, uh, of uh, Mexican American studies, uh, you know, in a specific school, that there are other means. If the, the legal system doesn't work, then you use uh, vigilante acts. Right, to frighten people, you know, into uh, that repressive, repressive acts. Obviously, when there are these repressive acts, there there will always rise the resistance because people understand very clearly who they are and what has to be done to assure their uh, justice. And so we see throughout the history that. Uh, of this period, we see acts that are being carried out uh, from people like the Clamor Public or newspapers saying this is what our rights are, and they're based on these laws, uh, and so forth. Or you have also the uh, social uh, mass groups that would go out in mass direct action. 
court system, the fighting for lands, uh, any number of, uh, of actions that needed to be taken, all the way from acts within the system, all the way to social uh, movements of all sorts that occurred. So that we have the example of mutualistas or mutual societies, uh, such as the Alianza Hispano-Americana, which emerged here in, the, in Tucson uh, in the late uh, 19th century. If you're going to have a civil rights uh, organization that tells you something, right, that means that they needed to have a civil rights organization, even though it was coming from a very middle class perspective. Okay. But nevertheless, it was, hey, something is wrong here, and so we need to have uh, the Alianza Hispano-Americana. Um, and you also had more radical groups, such as the Congreso, uh, that met in 1911 in Laredo, Texas, uh, which was very clear. Uh, this is what we want, and this is what we will have and we will fight for this, and, and we will not compromise. But it was a very clear uh, direction. So all the way from the barrios, uh, all the way to the fields then, uh, we have seen uh, elements of labor organizing, uh, we have seen mutualistas using the court system, mass direct actions, uh, even actions such as the San Diego movement, where a group of individuals got together and said, you know something, we have to recover our lands, we will fight for our lands, and we will join with, uh, with blacks, we will join with Native Americans, we will all join together and fight so that we can assert our rights, uh, because obviously they're not happening institutionally. Okay. Uh, obviously it was a very, very short-run move but you can see in it the expression uh, that, was, uh, that was there uh, within these uh, communities uh, as, as, at that time. Now, examples flourish all around us of uh, activism uh, from you know, the perspective of being uh, Mexicano. Uh, that, uh, for example, we have the uh, Feminist Congress of 1950. Mexico uh, that organized a group of 800 women who came together in the midst of, uh, of the revolution in, in Mexico and proposed many things. But what is really most important, they proposed, okay, so we're having a revolution here that's being run by men. When that re revolution is over, we women want to have exactly the same uh, results as the men will have. In fact, what we want, if land is going to be distributed, that women also get a piece of land, right? Why this was important? Because it was economically going to equalize. And not only do we want the land, but the land is worthless unless we go get the seed and the tools with which to work it, right? The other thing that was 1915, remember this, but we want our health clinics for all women so that we can control our bodies. We want birth control information to be distributed all over. We want education for all our children to be free from kindergarten all the way to university. And we want the hijo natural designation to be dropped forever. There is no such thing as a child born out of wedlock, an illegitimate child. All children are fully human, dignified beings. And what was this? Because many of the elites would have children with their maids, right? And never recognize them. And here it was, hey, the masters, you know, must recognize their children. And so it is these examples that, uh, that were uh, in front of uh, many of us by the 1960s. <coughs> and throughout the 20th century, the basis of building up uh, to help become part of the great civil rights movements 
uh, social movements that uh, you know served uh, to bring us all together in a great uh, sense of what is the possibility for this country. Uh, it is interesting to me that uh, when Dr. King was assassinated, just before he was assassinated, he had called for the march, you know, the, the march on Washington by all people. The, you know, this was going to be the fight against poverty, uh, economic rights, and he invited the Mexican American Chicano leadership, Corky Gonzalez, Reyes Tijerina. Uh, he invited the Native American movement to join all together. That we must all together be in this uh, civil rights movement. And uh, it certainly, you know, as the African American uh, civil rights movement had enormous, uh, enormous influence on many of us. Visually, uh, emotionally, and also in the sense of the enormous sacrifices that we would see uh, in image every night on TV. And to this day, still the image remains in my mind of a little girl being led by a United States Marshal into a school. You know, and that kind of uh, of tremendous uh, sense of what was possible by a child. And so that that opened for us all these uh, uh, you know, abilities to move forward uh, as women, uh, as uh, Mexicanas, as a full community of the barrios, and certainly to bring about also the, the whole elements of what we were looking at, uh, which are many. Certainly, one of the major contributions that was made in Tucson was in the fight for the civil rights of immigrants. And, uh, and so, you know, uh, when we look at Tucson today, and we see the, uh, the struggle uh, that has been ongoing in terms of the militarization of the border, in communities where uh, the border, as an elder of the Donato Nation, was said to be pierced our hearts, right? Because the free movements of people had always been there. The families, whether indigenous, Native American, and others moving back and forth freely for ceremonies for family reasons and so forth, um, and, and uh, the unity of family, which was so important, of the landscape itself, that you cannot divide this great uh, desert and its people uh, as well. And so that uh, here in Arizona in the last, uh, since uh, Operation Gatekeeper in 1994 was announced, uh, many of the flow of migrants has come to the desert with a purpose, and that is that they will die in the desert, and this will deter others from coming. And uh, it was announced by the United States government, and the United States government said people will die, but that will deter others from coming through. Uh, what they called it was collateral damage. Right? Uh, and we have seen thousands of people die since then. Out of uh, you know, the social movements that Rosa in Tucson, uh, one of the ones that has uh, persisted and continued from the early 1970s to today has been that centered in the borderlands and the movements of people back and forth. Uh, certainly, this movement stands on the traditions uh, that were said by many others. Uh, who fought in defense of what were called the foreign workers. Uh, people like uh, Josefina Fierro, Luisa Moreno, Rose Sherman, who established the Committee in Defense of the Foreign Born in Los Angeles. If there was ever a 
convert Corona, whom I consider to be the equal of Cesar Chavez, uh, because from him came the concept of workers being organized, undocumented workers. It didn't matter what country they came from. Uh, when they were working in the fields or anywhere in the factories, that they should be organized like any other worker. Chole de la Torre, their organization called CASA, Antonio and Javier Rodriguez, uh, Maria Jimenez from Texas, Roberto Martinez, uh, who led the Quaker organization in San Diego that led to the documentation of the deaths in the desert. Gustavo Gutierrez, perhaps one of Arizona's greatest legendary organizers, who organized the undocumented in the fields of, uh, uh, of Phoenix. Uh, Lisa Ruaga in South Texas, who began this, the asylum for Central Americans, and Rogelio, Rogelio Nunez, also from South Texas, and many, many others, all along the border, on both sides of the border. And uh, Margo will now tell us a little more specifics about this really strong movement that has entered in Tucson, but really is all part of You know, when we talk about the last 50 years of the civil rights movement, we really can't talk about only 50 years. We have to, we have to look back. And as Lupe said, um, it's, just, it's, it's just been a wonderful honor for me to have been part of this and to uh, uh, been able to participate, been able to make a, a small contribution. But I think it is important for us to think about it uh, contextually. One of the reasons that, you know, of these many threads that, that Lupe discussed, sort of the broad brush, um, the border, the migration of people, immigration, uh, the role of enforcement, begins to sort of pull away and distinguish itself um, as being singularly important in the civil rights struggles in Tucson and certainly in the southwest, certainly all along the border. Um, for a long time, forever, really up until quite recently, um, the southwestern border was not enforced and that was purposeful. We had a schizophrenic kind of immigration policy, a policy that on the one hand said you had to apply for admission and on the other hand said come and provide work in various industries in the United States. Um, you know, during the Bracero program, labor contractors actually drove buses down into Mexican communities and recruited workers and drove them back up, thousands of them. And that wasn't the beginning of the tradition. The tradition really goes back to the late 1800s where particular sending communities would go to particular receiving communities. And those relationships were built that have lasted ever since. And so grandfathers, great-grandfathers, fathers, sons, all work for the same families in the same communities. And those relationships are really what drives the north to south mobility. Certainly in the Taunotham community, for example, people moved um, south in the times of the rains and planted um, engaged in sacred ceremonies in very particular spots and in the times of who weather came north. And so we can't ever think about civil rights in Tucson or southern Arizona out of this very special context of the north to south experience. Part of that was when the border began to change people began to adapt. 
And, you know, during um, the Bracero program, which of course means just arms, there were about three million people that participated in that um, officially. There were about 13 million that participated in the si on the side. There was, there was no regularization. For those of you that were around in the 50s and the 60s, I'm sure you remember the horrific stories of farm workers being carried in cattle trucks and cattle trucks rolling and 50 or 60 people being killed at one time, of people living in the fields, not in ranch houses, um, just horrid circumstances. Uh, but there was, there was no regularization. There were no labor law protections, and people came and went as they, as they, as they chose. There were a lot of wildcat strikes. There weren't any organized unions, but there were certainly bargaining units at many of the ranches just made up on the spur of the moment of workers organizing themselves and demanding better wages and working condition conditions. And, you know, that history then has just begun to foment. And um, there was a lot of organizing that, was, that went on on both sides of the border, for example, during the 60s and the 70s when the United Farm Workers Union was at its peak, although the leadership of the Farm Workers Union was very anti-immigrant. But the workers, of course, were not. And, and so there was a lot of organizing in farms and ranches um, throughout the Southwest and up and down the valley in California, uh, throughout Texas, and in all the border communities along, along the way. Um, I was privileged to run a strike in the late 60s and early 70s, and I lived in Tijuana, and the strike was in the city of San Diego. And every night we would have house meetings in Tijuana with workers who were then permitted to enter with what was called grommeted cards. And they were day workers. And they lived in Mexico, and they came and worked, and that, those numbers were not capped. You know, today there's a lot of discussion in the immigration reform bill about how many agricultural workers we should admit and what the cap should be. Back in the day, grommeted workers weren't capped. Anybody who wanted to work in the field presented identification and was given um, sort of a variation on a green card and could come and go uh, every day. And we organized those people, and those people were organized all along the border. Um, that was a very important era because that was the beginning of organized labor. And at the same time, Bert Corona in the cities, uh, Gustavo in, in Phoenix and all the areas around Phoenix of farm communities, Tony Orendine in the valley in Texas, people began to organize workers as workers, not as U.S. workers or Mexicano workers, workers as workers for worker protection. The other thing that we began to see um, as all these threads came together was something called Las Madres en Contra de la Guerra in Vietnam the Chicano moratorium. And that was just absolutely phenomenal because during the, during the Vietnam War, of course, there was a draft. And who dropped out of high school? And who didn't go to college? But people of color. And, and so Las Mamas Mexicanas in LA organized something called the Chicano moratorium. Thousands upon thousands of people marched every year in the Chicano moratorium against the war. Pura raza. Ruben Salazar, the reporter from the LA Times, was killed at the Chicano moratorium. The Chicano moratorium, in my view, was one of the great turning points of the, of the movement against the war in Vietnam, and certainly called into focus the inequities in, in the draft and was the beginning of the end, the beginning of the movement and the end of the draft to end compulsory service that so desperately affected uh, young men of color. Tucson in southern Arizona has always had um, a really righteous role in all of this. And I guess wherever we are in whoever's community we're, we're in, 
we would say the same thing because we certainly um, were quite fortunate to meet compañeras and compañeros from, from many diverse communities engaged in the same kinds of things that we were engaged in. I was very privileged to be part of something called El Concilio Manzo, the Manzo Area Council in Barrio Hollywood. And I had come home from running the strike, tomato strike in San Diego. And um, Richard Nixon was going to defund the war on poverty. And so there were neighborhood centers, neighborhood war on poverty offices everywhere. And the one in Hollywood, everybody quit because after all, it was going to be defunded. So I applied for a job and was hired as director and hired a bunch of people from the neighborhood and we took off and, and had a great run. And as we began to respond to the community and respond to what uh, people in the community were saying to us about what they would like to, to what services they would like to have, you know, we didn't care because it was going to get defunded anyway. So. We organized the first community-based organization in the country to provide advocacy and representation for undocumented people. Because as enforcement has always gone in waves in the border, during the Nixon years, there were neighborhood raids. I remember the Border Patrol would sit outside St. Margaret's Church after the Spanish Mass and pick people up. They'd go to the soccer games over there at Menlo Park. And, and so we began to, to represent people who were undocumented. What we also saw there was another manifestation of the mutual aid societies that Lupe described, um, Sociedad Porfirio Diaz and the others. It really had been around since probably forever, but as far as I know, like the mid-1800s, long before there was a border that just provided for mutual assistance. And so people in the community organized themselves and came to us and said, we, here's what we need to have happen. How can you help us make it happen? And, and we did. Um, a theory then that became very prominent and sort of began with the organizing efforts of Burkrona and others in LA and, and people were, were working for the farm workers and the other farm worker organizations because there were many that popped up around the country was that workers really were setting the agenda and that workers were controlling the movement and it was a redefinition of worker there weren't you know citizen workers and undocumented workers there were just workers and that people had a right to work. And people had a right to have their family together and not live in fear. And of course, I'm sure all of you know, have heard of the mass deportations that took place in the mines and Bisbee and other places during the Depression, where many US citizens were deported with Mexicano workers. That sort of matured into this idea that everyone has a right to work, regardless of status. Status shouldn't be part of the equation. And so then, those same workers became organizers for social change within unions and within the trade union movement. In the mid-70s, the Justice Department um, began to notice a lot of organizing in California along the southern border and um, in the valley in Texas. And myself and three other women were indicted on a 52 count federal felony indictment that alleged anything you do for undocumented people is aiding and abetting felons. And until then, the United States didn't use those kinds of words. There was, as, as Lupe said, the extra judicial, extra systemic vigilante racism, uh, the lynchings, the, the, the terrible violent acts against people. There were, um, you know, the breaking of strikes, but there was not the criminalization of people who 
advocated or associated with people without papers. That was really the beginning. And um, we fought that struggle, and those, um, uh, Jimmy Carter was elected president, thank goodness, or I probably would be in some women's prison still today. Uh, and the, the Attorney General, William French Smith, dismissed the indictment. The Concilio Manzo was named the first community-based outreach organization in the country, authorized to represent undocumented people. Today there are thousands and thousands of them, Catholic social services, Lutheran social services, neighborhood organizations, really a, a very rich, rich group. It was also the first time that undocumented people, when put in that caste by the government, fought back. And um, for example, we sent a little caravan of undocumented people uh, to drive across the country who just drove up to the Justice Department and asked to see the Attorney General. Just did it. Um, and of course, they're now it's just waves and waves and waves and much more sophistication. But it is, I believe, a very exciting, very exciting um, phenomena to watch flourish like a flower that opens of, of um, self-definition and self-control of one's destiny. There was a, a horrible case in the late 70s, I think it was in 1976 or 1977. It involved um, a man who was actually on the County Board of Supervisors in Cochise County and his two sons, the Hannigan family. And they um, had a ranch by the border and they caught four young men coming up to work and they stripped them naked and they tortured them, they burned them, they hung them from a tree, they shot them with uh, buckshot and they left them for dead. But they didn't die, and they went back into Agua Prieta, and they called us, and we put together a campaign that took a couple of years, but it was a cross-border effort of people in Agua Prieta and people in Douglas that called on the United States for a federal prosecution. One of the most exciting um, community events I've ever participated in was driving up to Douglas, where we had called a rally one night on the border right on the fence. And um, I remember my idea was to stand on top of a truck and talk in a bullhorn about sending these postcards uh, to the U.S. Attorney and demanding a prosecution. There were thousands of people. The bullhorn was useless. And the community really was one. The border, the border didn't have anything to do with anybody that was there. And their outrage at what had happened to these boys. The Hannigans were acquitted in the state court trial. The United States did bring federal charges. And during the, the period that passed, um, and well, we were doing the campaign to get the federal charges brought, the father passed. The boys were indicted. One was acquitted and one was found guilty. Um, then a very interesting thing began to happen at the end of the 1970s is coming into the barrio all of a sudden were people who had walked from El Salvador and from Guatemala. I remember the day that this woman walked into Concilio Manza with a bullet in her shoulder that she got a couple of days earlier in El Salvador. There were, I think there were 23 or 24 professionals, um, professors, women in nylons and heels that tried to walk through organ pipe, and half of them died. And I was involved in representing those that survived and in assisting with the return of the bodies to Salvador of the ones that had perished and trying to figure out how to get the people back to families um, without calling attention to those relatives so that the relatives wouldn't be killed at the airport. And so all of a sudden, El Concilio Manzo's scope widened from Valley Hollywood and the issues of the border to refugiados that were coming from many countries away. And, and the community in Hollywood was very, very supportive of these brothers and sisters. 
we set up the first in-detention defense project in the country. You know, now undocumented people are detained in, in probably there's 500 facilities across the country, both ICE facilities and contract facilities, county jails, all that kind of thing. At that time, I think there were five. And the one for this part of the country was in El Centro. And when we set up that project, uh, there were a thousand people being deported every week, many of them who'd come up through this desert. And we were able to stop those deportations in their tracks. At that point, um, the United States was training the death squads in Salvador. They were training them out here at the Pinal Air Park. And when people would get off the INS airplanes in San Salvador, they'd be, they'd be gunned down by death squads that were taught by U.S. troops out here in Pinal County. So we were able to come up with a strategy. Uh, I filed notices of appearance for everybody, and so they couldn't have multiple hearings. In essence, I controlled the calendar. There couldn't be 10 judges. There could only be one. And we were just a ragtag volunteer group of people that went and prepared these asylum applications and brought that system to its knees. And I share that story with you because as we see these poignant, grievous human rights violations, we should never think that we can't do something about it because we always can. We always can outsmart those who would commit such atrocities. All of those people, by the way, regularized in the amnesty of 1986. Out of that work in El Centro was born the sanctuary movement. And so then we got really good at getting people across the board. Part of the, pe part of the some of the people that participated in the sanctuary movement were nuns and priests from Nogales who would watch from Sacred Heart Church and from homes right on the border and when the Border Patrol was changing shifts, they tell people to come on. Refugees from Tucson went all over the United States, and policy and hearts changed because they sat at the kitchen table and they told strangers their story, and it makes a difference. Then, with the amnesty of 86, there was a period, and Lupe and I disagree with, about this, but here's my point of view. There was a little period when most of the activists went to sleep because we thought that um, the amnesty of 86 was a good thing. We all fought ferociously against the worker, uh, the employee san employer sanctions, but we lost that. And we were, we were very, very pleased when amnesty uh, occurred. You know, I want to share with you um, a phenomena that you may or may not be aware of. Regularization happens about once a generation. We have this statutory scheme that says uh, if you're a family member of a U.S. citizen or a lawful permanent resident, you can apply to immigrate, or if you're in certain employment categories, you can apply to immigrate. But ever since that scheme was devised, really it began in the 1920s, um, it never has worked. And so every once a generation we say, okay, we're just going to regularize everybody who's here. The first one was in 1924, and that was the year that we established the Border Patrol. And the Border Patrol, by the way, wasn't established to control Mexicanos from coming south to north. It was um, established to enforce the Chinese Exclusion Acts, so Chinese workers wouldn't come up through Mexico. And in 1924, we said, okay, we better have a sign them up and see who's here. So everybody who was in the United States that wasn't born here was signed up. The next one we did was in 1948. That was um, a thank you for people that worked in the war effort. The next one we did was in 1972. And that one was really, um, of all of them, reflective of the moment. It was a celebration of the contribution of the non-citizen to the fabric of American society. Literature, music, sweat, all of it. It was a celebration of that contribution in the true spirit of what else was going on in America in the late 60s and the early 70s. And then, of course, in 1983, 
1986, I'm sorry, was the first time that there was this sort of radical right turn. And rather than calling it registry, regularization, we called it amnesty. And of course, amnesty means I'm going to forgive you because you came to clean the toilet or pick the fruit. I'm going to pardon your transgression. And in a public policy sense, that was huge because that was the beginning of the militarization of the southwestern border. You know, a lot of organizations um, came um, in the years after amnesty. Cer certainly the Derechos Humanos was one of the first that came in the years immediately pre following amnesty uh, to raise issues and raise consciousness about who was left out. And as time has passed to offer stiff opposition to the militarization. But Tucson also has produced the Samaritans, a group of people that go to the desert every single day of the year, several carloads of them, doctors and nurses, all sorts of people, looking for people who are sick, near death, to rescue, walking the trails, leaving food, leaving water. No More Deaths, an organization that uh, I was privileged to co-found, that is committed to trying to reduce the number of deaths and suffering in the desert. People come from all over the country to stay in the desert with us. We have, we have spring break in the desert, for example, for college students. That's an alternative to going to the beach. And we have to turn people away. So many students want to come. Uh, people spend the summer with us. Tucsonans are there year round, walking those trails, looking for people, leaving food, leaving socks, leaving water. Humane Borders, the first to put out water stations on both sides of the border, big blue tanks with flags. All of this was begun really in the post-1986 period when NAFTA, passed shortly thereafter, began to have such a devastating impact on Mexican communities and force people to come north. So we saw a change in migration while we saw the militarization of the border, we saw a change in sort of these benign relationships between sending communities and receiving communities where generations of workers had come and gone to people who were forced off the land, to people who babies were, whose babies were starving, to people who had no other choice but to risk their life crossing the desert. And at the same time, we saw the border be, begin, the beginning of the militarization of the border and of course now we see, see it in the, the extreme. But I'm very hopeful. And I'm, I'm very hopeful, and I want to I share with you why. Because I hope that you've taken what, what I've shared with you tonight uh, in the context that undocumented workers really are the revolutionaries of our time. And they have been for a while. They really have, but at this moment, they really are. Because they are reconfiguring the world economy. And it's not just the world economy um, in terms of Mexico and the United States, because for a very long time, that's, that hasn't been two economies, that's one. And, and sort of it's one with Canada sort of melted in. But in terms of the economies of Mexico and the United States, that's one, that's not two. Um, and that certainly has been the, the, the experience uh, from the Second World War to date. But I say that undocumented workers are the revolutionaries of today because they are not accepting of their role. They're not willing to say that the United States, that it's okay for us to have a moat around the United States where the third world is excluded. That it's not okay for Europe to have a moat where the third world is excluded. And they are creating the wealth and they are taking the wealth. And in terms of Mexican workers in the United States, they carry two economies on their back. They carry the United States and they carry Mexico. And for a long time, for the last 25 years or so, uh, 
remittances sent back home by Mexican workers have made the United States, have made Mexico, the United States, uh, second uh, highest spending trade partner. That slipped a little bit in this crazy moment of mass deportations, but it'll be back. The reason that I say that I'm, I'm very hopeful is the following. You've heard a lot lately about the comprehensive immigration reform bill of 2013 and how you know we didn't get it right back in 1986. Well, the bill that's that's being debated now is not comprehensive. It's it's um, for the moment. It is as we know because the statute has never worked, and so. More than a generation has passed since 1986, so it's time to sign everybody else up who's here and figure out who's here and, and stop prosecuting innocent people and criminalizing them. Um, the production of the whole generation of dreamers is just delightful because for all intents and purposes, those young people are US citizens. They're so full of themselves. It's just lovely. and and. You know, they won't be still. They're, they're just lovely revolutionaries. They won't be put in their place. Um, I, I had the distinct privilege of representing the, the group that sat in McCain's office a couple of years ago. And, um, you know, his, his office manager came at 5 o'clock, and of course the police were there and everything. And, and she said, Well, it's 5 o'clock, you, now you have to go, you know. And they said, Okay, just take us away. So she said, well, we'll keep the office open now till 6. <laughs> and so at 6, she said, you guys have to go. And he said, just, just arrest us. OK, we're going to stay open till 7. And that kept going until about a quarter till 10. And she said, I can't stay here anymore. And they said, we told you five hours ago to just arrest us. And that was the beginning of Dreamers taking over the Senate, the Hart Senate building, and Senate and representative offices across the country and saying to elected officials, we are here, we're not afraid, we're not embarrassed, our parents have earned the right to be regularized, they're workers, they deserve it, now give it to us. And that's what they're saying today. And, and you know, it's just, it, it, I, I don't want to offend any Republicans in the room if there happen to be a couple, but I, I have to share this with you. In the, the presidential election, of 2008, there were 7.4 million Latino voters in the United States. And in uh, 2012, there were 24 million. So what do you think 2016 looks like? And, you know, when regularization passes, because it will, these kids are never going to forget. They won't forget. And the grandkids of these workers will never forget. And, and that really is the tomorrow. That really is the tomorrow, and it's a very exciting tomorrow. And the discussion won't be tomorrow about the next generation of legalization. The discussion will be, you know what? Nation-state borders are really an archaic idea. They really don't work anymore. They don't work today. We know they don't work today. We know ideas cross borders. We know business crosses borders, finance. Um, spiritual concepts, we can communicate. My nephews play with people in Russia on these games. I mean, there are no borders. There are only borders in terms of maintaining these moats where the wealth is kept inside and we try and keep the third world outside. Well, that's not going to survive. That's, that, in, that is in itself an archaic idea. And so, you know, I hope you join me in being very enthusiastic about the future. And those of you that are young will, will be part of it, and more power to you. I just want to be there. I want to be rocking on the porch, because I think it'll be about 30 years, and I want to watch those walls come down, because they will. So, you know, when people are worried about the security aspects of this bill and the walls that will be built, I'm not, that doesn't bother me a bit, because they're short term. They're short -term. They have a short life. They can't be sustained. So I think I've said enough. And if you all have some questions, I think we'd both be glad to entertain questions. Thank you very much.